Welcome back to the Four Real Movie Club. We are moving on to our second movie that for this month where we talk about Oscar-nominated films for Best Picture. In this segment, we will be talking about The Theory of Everything, which is a 2014 British bi- biographical romantic drama film. Let's throw more adjectives in there. Directed by James Marsh and adapted by Anthony McCartan from the memoir Traveling to Infinity, My Life with Stephen by Jane Wilde Hawking. So his wife. Yeah, there you go. Which deals with her relationships with her ex-husband. Uh-oh, should have read ahead. Theoretically, <laughs> this is Stephen Hawking uh, is diagnosed with motor neuron disease and his success in physics. The film stars Eddie Redman, the creepy guy from Jupiter Ascending, and Felicity Jones with Car- uh, Charlie Cox, Emily Watson, Simon McBurney, Christian McKay, and David Thewlis yeah. um, featured in supporting roles. The film has had its world premiere in the 2014 Toronto International Film Festival on the 7th of September of last year, 2014. So, we're going to start with you this time, Brianna. What were your initial thoughts on the theory of everything? You know, I thought it was going to be a lot different. I thought it would actually be more based on the book. But my initial thoughts were just kind of, bored I was so bored throughout this entire movie and I thought that it was just a a love story that's all it was it didn't really get much into his illness or their marriage or just any of the hardships with the handicap so I I just thought it was so average I don't even know how it got on well I guess just because who it's about is the only reason that it could have even possibly gotten on the Oscar list it was horrible Mr. Mango, what were your thoughts on the theory of everything? Uh, all right. Um, that's a nice way to say this. Yeah, I think when you like sigh like that, I don't think it's good. <laughs> <laughs> it mildly sucked. Let's put it this way. It's my least favorite out of the bunch here, and that's not saying much because I, the movie that I like the best out of this, spoiler alert, is Birdman, and I was that's the first one I watched, and I was like, crap, if that's the best one, I'm going to really dislike these movies. Uh, theory of Everything is not full of everything. Uh, it needs a lot more to it. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> yeah, it sucked. <laughs> Uh, when it comes to casting, at least for me, I don't know too many of these people, especially when it comes to British films. I am not up to date on British actors unless you played Doctor Who. Um, the film, like I said, stars Eddie Redman and uh, Felicity Jones. Tony, what do you think of the casting for this film? Well, we've got the three main people in the film all have ties to comic book movies, which uh, I found kind of interesting. Eddie Redmayne was the secondary choice that they were going to have for Dr. Doom, which uh, they decided to go with somebody else. I can't remember his name, but good for him. (laughs) Maybe. I don't know. He did kick ass in this part though. Uh, He is without a doubt the best part of this movie, like hands down. uh, Eddie Redmayne, I think should win the Oscar, but everybody else sucks. Like Felicity Jones is very attractive. She uh, handled the role fine, but you could have put anybody else in that role and they would have done the same job. And she sucked as uh, Black Cat in Mighty Ran, so she loses points for that. Charlie Cox, Daredevil, pretty likable guy. And, you know, I bought into the idea that he would be somebody that she could fall for. And, you know, I didn't hate him for, like, breaking up a marriage or anything like that. But, again, pretty much any guy who's around that age and uh, attractive enough and charming enough and whatever could play that part. It's This is a one-man show. And it, I would have been fine with this movie existing of just Eddie Redmayne doing his impression of Stephen Hawking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Anybody else get the picture of Howard Wallowitz from the Big Bang Theory <laughs> doing his version? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't the only horrible human being. The weird thing, though, is Benedict Cumberbatch played Stephen Hawking in a movie before, and he was nominated for a buttload of awards for that. And I didn't see that movie that he had played it in, but I did see a couple of clips just to compare the two, and Eddie Redmayne kicks his ass. <laughs> like, he is so much better at it. 
Uh, Brianna, what were your thoughts on the casting for The Theory of Everything? You know, I have some of this, pretty much the same thoughts. Eddie Redmayne did an awesome job. He, I, I, you know, I don't know too much about Stephen Hawking or what he looks like. I've seen, I think the only experience I have with Stephen Hawking is an episode of Family Guy, to be honest. That's all I know about him, (laughs) which probably isn't a good impression. But he did an awesome job. He, I think he got it down pretty good. And everybody else, I never even heard of them. I don't even know who they are. So, yeah, Eddie Redmayne, the best thing about the movie. Uh, to give some facts about the film before we roll on to the next couple of questions, uh, it, it opened to a positive reception worldwide and it's been nominated for various uh, accolades in award shows and film festivals. It's received four Golden Globe Award nominations, winning the Golden Globe Award for Best Actor in a Motion Picture Drama and uh, the Best Original Score. Uh, it received the 21st Annual Sc- Screen Actors Guild Award nominations, winning one for the Screen Actors Guild Award for Outstanding Performance by a Male Actor in a Lead Role, Redmayne. So he, he's he got back-to-back wins there. Uh, it received 10 nominations in the British Academy Film Awards, or BAFTA, which sounds like a creature from Star Wars, and went on to win three. Outstanding British Film, Best Leading Actor, again, and Best Ad- uh, Adapted Screenplay, which is Anthony McCartan. Uh, the film also received five Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture, which is our theme tonight, Best Actor, Best Actress, and they didn't tell me the other ones. So, just like we talked about with the previous film, if you guys were listening, if not, go back and watch that video. Cheap plug. Uh, what did you think about the musical score when it came to this movie? I know we touched base a little bit on the last film, but uh, what did you think on this one, Tony? Uh... Yeah, I don't remember much about it, but I do have this as my potential pick to win. So something must have made me think that it could win. <laughs> and I probably, if I listen back to it, there's probably a couple of different things that I liked about it. Um, I vaguely remember thinking back now that there might have been a sequence where I thought that the music was good and I just didn't write the note down. And I can't remember what that would be. I sound like I'm like saying this out of my ass and making it up, but I'm telling the truth here. <laughs> Um, Johan Johansson, I think, is the guy who did this. Yeah, that's uh, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that right. We'll just call him John John. Yeah, good old Johnny <laughs> boy. Uh, Johnny boy, uh, good job there. Um, <laughs> there. There was definitely something in here. I wish that I would have written that note down, but I watched all these movies when I was laying in bed trying to go to sleep after being up for like 24 hours, so they all kind of um, had like sparse notes, you know, written on my phone and stuff, but. Uh, I've heard good things about it. I've obviously heard it <laughs> since I watched the movie, and it seems like that's probably the front runner. So, um, thumbs up. Brianna, what were your thoughts on the uh, musical score behind the theory of everything? You know, the only time I even remember the music because I did not write down anything about the music in this movie was I think there what might have been like a, a a sad scene at the end, and that's all I remember. But, yeah, I have no thoughts on it. So I didn't write anything down about the music. That might have been the same one that I was thinking of. Probably towards the end. Yeah. It wasn't a happy thing. I know that. No. Because there's not much happy in this movie. <laughs> so, uh, an interesting post-production note that I think is worth mentioning is, uh, during the editing, filmmakers tried to remake Hawking's synthesized voice. Uh, not by Howard Wallowitz, but just tried it on their own. And it didn't turn out as they wanted. So, however, Hawkins himself, after seeing the film, told the filmmakers that he enjoyed the film so much, he granted them permission to use his own synthesized voice, which is used in the final film. Do you think if they would have tried to do their own style of his synthesized voice, that it would have taken away from the film? Uh, probably got chastised, criticized. Uh, Tony? Kind of depends. I mean, if they tried to make him Darth Vader, then yeah. <laughs> Particles. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I probably wouldn't have been able to tell. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, it depends on how bad it is. But if they could get him to do it, then cool. That gets uh, Hawking a screen credit. And, you know, he could qualify for SAG now, I think. Yeah, yeah he's been in Big Bang Theory and a couple other things. Yeah. He was a cartoon character in Family Guy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Brianna, what were your thoughts on if they had tried to do their own synthesizing of his voice? 
Did you say that they actually used his voice? They they used the, uh, the I guess whatever Wait. program or synthesization they used. They used Stephen Hawking's rather than trying to do it on their own. You know, I thought it, if that's really what he sounds like, which I guess it does, because then you know if they they had made that mention in the movie about it not being British. <laughs> I think it was something like that. Yeah, uh, after they had his voice, they're like, "Oh, he's not British. It's it's an American voice." But yeah, I guess if it, if people might know him by his voice. So if it sounded different than what he actually sounded like, then maybe people wouldn't have identified with it as much. But um, I don't know. I I need to look him up more and find out what he actually sounds like. I have no idea. They just hooked him up to Peter Frampton's guitar. <laughs> Do, Do you, you feel? feel? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, the entire time this movie was going, I just kept thinking of that scene in Family Guy. That's <laughs> that. Uh, I guess where he's trying to have sex with his wheelchair partner, <laughs> and they're just like, "Oh, that's just what I kept thinking of the entire time," and it ruined it for me. <sighs> So, one question I'm going to ask you guys, and mainly because it bugs the hell out of me as a person that wanted to see some of these films, but, you know, they do this stupid thing. With Oscar-nominated films for Best Picture, there is a high probability that half the nominations get limited releases. Why do you think they do that, and why are they assholes that when a guy wants to go see Birdman in the theaters, they make it in a theater that's two hours away? Tony? I think it's that pretentiousness. Uh, a lot of these movies that... It's not that they release them... Because they're Oscar-related movies, they get nominated for the Oscars because they're these independent kind of films. And that's like the snooty, this is better than the other mainstream kind of thing that I think lends itself to a lot of the different nominees. Is uh, You could look at a movie like uh, Grand Budapest, and that probably has the widest release out of everything. Yeah. Outside of maybe Birdman. But um, these are the type of movies that usually independent films have a lot more heart and a lot more style to them. But these, I don't think necessarily are the case. I think that this is a case where if you go to an art gallery, you might find a couple of Picassos, but you're also going to find a lot of douchey people that think that they're Picasso. Um, so I think it's a byproduct of them not being able to catch a mainstream audience. So if they don't release them that far, then that kind of makes it seem like exclusive. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the Academy people are like, well, you know, everybody's talking about – I'm going to say right now, Captain America the Winter Soldier, probably the best movie in 2014, Easily. I would think. Uh, and that should have been nominated, at the very least, nominated for best uh, adapted screenplay. It's mm -hmm. annoying me that it doesn't uh, have that nomination, but – you look at a movie like that, and it's like, well, it's a stupid Captain America beat em up comic book movie. Yeah, well, it's also a really good spy thriller. And if you look at something like Theory of Everything, well, it's got this, you know, it's about religion, and it's about uh, science, and history, and love, and whatever. No, it's about Stephen Hawking being a douchebag for the first half of the movie, and then he gets his comeuppance. That's essentially what it comes out to. He was a douchebag. He is an ass. Like, I didn't like him at all. Until he ends up, you know, being wheelchair bound. And then I felt a little bit bad for him. But then that's the point where his wife turns into a bitch. And it's like, I'm supposed to root for these people? They're a bunch of jerks. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, they're awful. So, you know, it's a good thing that they're not eating up screens in these movie theaters. Because I'd much rather watch Guardians of the Galaxy in three different movie screens. That makes sense. Uh, Brianna, what are your thoughts on why these Oscar-nominated films, such as The Theory of Everything... Uh, get limited releases. It's, it just in the, it seems to be just in the states. I don't know why they do it. They're just assholes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Simple place to put it. None of these movies played at my local theater at all, which mm -hmm. I don't think anybody would have gone to see them anyway, just because they are out there seeing the actual good movies that released so, <laughs> this year. But yeah, they're just stupid. So I think it's safe to say that the Academy promotes piracy. That there's no way in the world you're going to be able to find this locally. Just go ahead and torrent it off the internet. So you, this is your fault, Academy. <laughs> no, we, we didn't do that. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, no, I went down to local Joe's on the corner. All these movies. 
We went to that one movie theater eight hours away. It's a rinky-dink uh, place. They don't okay. even have popcorn. They just give you, like, uh, kale. It felt kale. like piracy. <laughs> Is there a movie theater that actually gives out kale? Oh, God, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Although I've been told that if you uh, put, like, olive oil and fry up or bake or whatever kale, that it comes out like potato chips, so I don't know. Maybe there's a popcorn method. Either way, anybody who do- eats that kind of stuff in a movie theater, you deserve to get punched. Yeah. And should go check out the theory of everything. So what we're going <laughs> to do is we're going to give everybody uh, one more time around the table. We'll start with you, Brianna. Final thoughts on the theory of everything, favorite, least favorite scenes, and a score to one to ten. Okay, I'm gonna score it. Gosh, this is a hard one. I'm gonna do four point five. I just, I just can't decide. No, I'm gonna no. I changed my mind. This is going down to a three. <laughs> For me, oh, I thought I, it was going down to a four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a drop. That's a drop. Um, you know, if they had made it more raw about actually what happened in their marriage it would have been okay if it wasn't just this love story or a wannabe love story i i would have liked it a lot more um but you know the whole the actually it's not even based on the book it's like loosely translated is what i want to call it. it the only thing that's it has anything to do with them is you know his disease so I didn't have any favorite scenes. Um, I thought it was kind of funny when they went to uh, his dad's place and they had those those stairs and they're like trying to push his wheelchair up these, you know, 50 stairs. I thought that was stupid. But yeah, I'm going to give it a three just because it was boring. Tony, what were your final thoughts? Favorite and least favorite scene and a score? One to ten. You can't get me to like a movie if you immediately start it off with a forced romance where you're basically telling the audience these two love each other because that's what happened and just go with it. We got shit to do. So that really annoyed me. And the rest of the film, for the most part, is essentially just, hey, this guy's life sucks, doesn't it? Smart guy, though, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> so I really didn't have any favorite scenes. Uh any of my least favorite scenes, I didn't like anything that dealt with them uh, setting up the relationship at the beginning because it felt so forced. And I guess if I had to pick a favorite scene, it probably would end up being that uh, symposium or whatever that he was doing, that uh, the lecture, where he you know cracked a couple jokes because it was like the only time I could chuckle a little bit in the movie. The rest of it was just kind of like... Here's a bunch of jerks and sadness, and he's horny as hell, and that's uncomfortable. (laughs) (laughs) You didn't laugh every time he fell out of his fell? (laughs) No, I felt too bad at that point. Like The first time when he falls and he hits his head on the concrete, I did laugh at that because it was filmed in such a weird way. It was just kind of like, boink, (laughs) like he bounced up in the air. But, you know, when he starts, like, not being able to talk right, whatever, that I'm like, ugh. I've done enough bad things in my life. I gotta stop laughing at these kind of things. <laughs> the fact that it's a real guy, that made it harder. Uh, at most, I'm giving this a five, and that should not happen with an Oscar film. So there you have it, folks. That is the theory of everything, and it is at least average, if not below average, in some of our instances. Stick around. Go to the third video and check out what we'll be talking about next, which is Wes Anderson's The Grand Budapest Hotel. So sit back, grab a Coke, eat some popcorn, and check out the next video, or some kale, and check out the next film here on the 4 Real Movie Club.